Pedicon Organizing Committee for having given me this opportunity. The topic for my topic is going to be Okay, is going to be on combination antimicrobial therapy, a rational approach. Now coming to the topic, what is combination antibiotic or what is combination therapy? It is a combination antibiotic is one in which two ingredients are added together for additional therapeutic effect. One of both ingredients may be antibiotics. Now it, examples of this are amoxicillin plus clavulinic acid, piperazolin plus tazobactam, cefepirazone plus sulbactam. Now these two drugs should have different mechanism of action. They shouldn't antagonize each other and there should be no supra-additive toxicity. Example of combination therapy is what we use. For example, when you are giving ceftriaxone for pneumonia and you suspect MRSA, you are adding vancomycin. Ceftriaxone plus vancomycin is combination therapy. Now, in any infection, the first step for us is to identify whether it's a viral infection or a bacterial infection. Once we know it's a bacterial infection, then we try to sort it out. Whether it's a localized infection or non-localized infection, immunocompromised host or a immunocompetent host, or whether it's a sick child or a well child. One we know, once we know it is a well child and it's only a community acquired infection, we resort to monotherapy with a single antibiotic that may be a narrow spectrum antibiotic. Usually for infections above the diaphragm, we give amoxicillin. For infections below the diaphragm, we resort to cefixim or ceftriaxone. This is common practice. Whereas in a sick child or an immunocompromised child, inpatient, we might have to resort to combination, anti uh, combination therapy empirically with broad spectrum antibiotics. Now, so what are the common indications for combination therapy? All of us practice neonatology and neonatal sepsis is one of the most commonest indication for combination therapy. We are monotherapy may not be useful. Then in serious bacterial infection we go in. And whenever we suspect polymicrobial contamination, for example in road rack accidents, injuries or perforation and peritonitis where E. coli and anaerobes, the organisms are multiple, we resort to combination therapy. And in nosocomial infection in immunocompromised patients, and to decrease the emergence of resistant strains when we use therapy for a long period as in tuberculosis and certain organisms like pseudomonas where resistance is likely to occur, we resort to combination therapy. In the same way to decrease dose related toxicity, we resort to combination therapy and for antitoxin effect, for example, clindamycin we add in cases of uh, with vancomycin for its antitoxin effect in MRSA septic shock and most important in spite of all these indications which I have said, all of us would like to get it right the first time. And we would, be, we would like to save the patient and when there is a risk of mortality, we don't want to take a chance. We resort to combination therapy. Where do we use combination therapy? Only in hospital acquired infections or do we use them in community acquired infections also? Common community infections I have listed, tonsillopharyngitis, otitis media, recurrent sinusitis, pneumonia, skin and soft tissue infections where we use amoxicillin but amoxicillin will not be helpful to you when the organism is going to be H-influenza or MSSA. In such cases, you will have to resort to amoxiclav. And again, for infections below diaphragm, for example, intra-abdominal infections or ESBL producing UTI, where E. coli and Klebsiella, ceftriaxone may not be useful. You will have to resort to piperazolin tazobactam or cefepirazone salbactam. And in pyogenic meningitis, when penicillin resistant pneumococcus is going to be there, you are going to resort to ceftriaxone plus vancomycin. So we use combination therapy in community acquired infections and we know the organism. And we, all of us, we use ceftriaxone right, left and center. It is the antibiotic of choice for most of us for pyogenic meningitis, pneumonia, urinary tract infection, leptospirosis and what not. We use it very widely because it is a very broad spectrum antibiotic with excellent CNS penetration. So we are right and is used in most severe community acquired infections. But where does ceftriaxone not help you at all? Ceftriaxone is susceptible to ESB producing organisms. It has absolutely no activity against MRSA, pseudomonas and anaerobes. So and again we know in hospital acquired infections organisms but may be plenty but the three important bugs which we are very worried about are MRSA, 
extended spectrum beta lactam is producing organisms and carbapenem resistant infections and enterobacteriaceae so how are we going to track it these three drugs the common drugs anti mrsa drugs which we use are vancomycin and linezolide vancomycin is excellent for its bactericidal effect mrsa pneumonias we use it but be beware of its nephrotoxicity linezolide is an ex usually we add to vancomycin for its antitoxin effect and also whenever you want to switch over vancomycin to oral drug we add linezolide but unfortunately it is bacteriostatic drug you cannot use when the child is having shock the other drug ticoplanin against mrsa is an excellent drug it is licensed in europe it is a im single dose op therapy also we can give for mrsa infections but unfortunately it is not fda approved so we we i do, we have not used it daptomycin very limited experience if we use it only in endocarditis probably clindamycin is used for its anti toxin effect esbl infections they are not uncommon in fact they say 40% 40 to 50 percentage of your utis may be esbl infections and again apart from uti intra abdominal sepsis and neonatal sepsis esbl producing organisms are very very common but we don't think in terms of esbl infections and respiratory infections or meningitis treatment for esbl infections are going to be your bl bli inhibitors that's piperacillin tazobactam and carbapenems are even preferable to bl bla combinations because they have a mortality benefit also next next group is cr infection carbapenem resistant infections as per tanu sengal our infectious disease specialty uh, uh, specialist from north india she says 50 to 60 percentage of her infections are carbapenem resistant infections we probably see 10 to 20 percentage of cases and they are very common in neonatal sepsis icu infections and immunocompromised patients drug of choice for carbapenem resistant infections is going to be colistin tigecycline or phosphomycin are we using these drugs yes colistin and uh, tigecycline we are using phosphomycin we don't have that much experience and the new drugs again for carbapenem resistant infections are going to be ceftazidim avibactam it is available and it's used widely in private sector too and mirapenem vabrobactam and astreonam avibactam these we are not we are not seeing them or we are not treating them probably because we have not got these cultures our cultures we have not got these drugs but they do exist okay and this this slide this will be my one slide after which i'll go to the subject proper this is the last slide which is an important slide this is about first beta lactamases for example whenever amoxicillin is inactivated by first generation beta lactamases we resort to amoxiclav or cephalospor this is the hierarchy of antibiotics i am going to talk to you now when this cephalosporins are inactivated by esbl producing organisms we resort to piperacillin tazobactam bl bla combinations when this bl bla combinations they are that is piptas is inactivated by amc beta lactamases we proceed to carbapenems and avibactam when carbapenems are inactivated by pseudomonas by carbapenemases we go to colistin tigecycline phosphomycin astreonam it is not that so it is amoxicillin cephalosporins piptas carbapenems colistin tigecycline that is the order we are supposed to proceed but in a very sick child who is a dying child with sepsis we may not follow this order we may directly resort to mirapenem plus vancomycin that is in whenever there is a high risk of mortality but you should know this order for you to proceed in a scientific manner now now i am coming before proceeding to rational antimicrobial combination antimicrobial therapy i will show you some of the uh, irrational combinations which should be avoided by us one by one first that i'll just list out the combinations first and talk to them about it a little later in pyeloma and cellulitis most of us have this uh, habit of choosing ampilox or amoxiclox it is an irrational combination in dysentery using oflox plus ornidazole irrational enteric fever using cefixim plus ofloxacin or using cefixim plus azithromycin is irrational in puo when you have already started on ceftriaxone and the child's fever is not coming down you resorting to mirapenem again adding mirapenem to is is not right in appendicitis when the child is already on piptas you adding metronidazole is again not going to help and in uh, vap and vap is ventilator associated pneumonia 
or hospital acquired pneumonia, piperacillin tazobactam plus vancomycin or piptaz plus amikacin in UTI. These are two combinations to be avoided, though we do use them, to be avoided because of their potential nephrotoxicity. And last, I'd say, for example, in a child who you think in terms of PO started the child on ceftriaxone, you have done all the investigations, MAD becomes positive. Okay, you know that it is a gold standard test, leptospirosis. And adding penicillin G, which is the drug of choice, to ceftriaxone, that is irrational. You will have to stop ceftriaxone and continue with uh, penicillin alone. Or if the patient is already responding to ceftriaxone, can't, no need to add penicillin also. This is again one of the things. Okay. Now, why I said ampilox or amoxiclox is irrational? This preparation is commercially available to us. But the, uh, you should understand that cloxacillin covers both streptococcus and staphylococcus. So, there is no role or need for ampicillin or amoxicillin. But the problem is cloxacillin is not commercially available easily. Most of us do not have cloxacillin. So, what we should do? But um, uh, so, th that is why we, uh, in that case, you please go for first generation cephalosporins, cephalexin or cephadroxyl for treating skin and soft tissue infections. There is no need to resort to ampicloxacillin. Amox, can we give amoxiclav to skin and soft tissue infections? Yes, you can give. It is a rational combination and it is a right combination. But please avoid as it is a very broad spectrum antibiotic. But nothing wrong in giving. The thing is, what do you mean by broad spectrum antibiotic? Any drug which acts on gram positive, gram negative and anaerobes is a broad spectrum antibiotic. Classical examples are coamoxiclav, piptas and meropenem. When you do not know the organism and the child is very sick, you resort to broad spectrum antibiotics. But when you know this is the infection, this is the organism, we resort to narrow spectrum drugs like cloxacillin or amoxicillin, right? And then next, next combination, why uh, ofloxacin plus orendazole is not rational? Dysentery can be bacillary or amoebic but cannot be both. And combining both adds to the cost of treatment, emergence of resistance and also increases the risk of complication. Cefixin plus azithromycin in enteric fever. If we call this as an indifferent combo where 1 plus 1 is equal to 1 only. It is not 2 because the combined effect is simply the effect of the more active drug alone and it increases the incidence of resistance. No point in adding. And again, ofloxacin resistance is widespread. 75 percentage of cases are ofloxacin resistance. No point adding with this uh, cefixin. And one slide about this enteric fever. Whenever you get an early response within 48 hours with ceftriaxone in a case of enteric fever, please review the diagnosis. It may not be enteric fever at all because usual time period for response is 5 to 6 days in enteric fever. So, be patient. Delayed response is known to occur and by the end of one week only, most of the time the fever comes down in enteric fever with ceftriaxone. If the child is well, always reassure the patient. We call it as therapeutic failure only when the, and when the fever persists beyond one week. That is, it occurs in less than 5 percentage of children when you have to switch to azithro. And again, in ceftriaxone, adding meropenem to ceftriaxone, so, in PUO is irrational because Brenapenem is one of the broadest spectrum antimicrobial. It covers everything on earth, gram positive, gram negative, pseudomonas, ESBL, MSSA, anaerobes and AMC beta lactamases producing organs which are resistant to piptase also. So, what is the point? Of the Mirapenem covers everything which ceftriaxone and piptase is covering. So, there is no need to add both, right? So, what does it cover? It does not cover, it does not cover MRS link. If you want to add something to Mirapenem, it has to be only vancomycin, right? Next, so the same way, piptase completely covers anaerobic organisms. So, there is no need to add metragel to piptase in a case of appendicitis. And again, piptase plus vancomycin in ventilator associated pneumonia, we do add this, but please, the nephrotoxicity and AK incidence is vancomycin is very much increased with piptase, avoid. Piptase and aminoglycosides, we call this as double gram negative coverage in UTI. You would have given piptase initially, then once the culture comes as amicacin positive, you add amicacin to it. Please avoid because it produces and whenever, uh, whenever you want, you are worried about the nephrotoxicity, first dose you give full dose irrespective of the renal status. Subsequently, estimate the serum creatinine 48 hours after starting a nephrotoxin and modify the subsequent doses. These are irrational combinations which are available commercially, but we are not going to use them because of the pharmacokinetic incompatibility. So, coming on to, I will come to now some certain rational antimicrobial combinations. How do they become successful? Using BLBLI, as I told you, in amoxiclav or ceftazidum, uh, cefepirosin sulbactam or piptaz in UTI is going to help you. And again, whenever you use beta lactamases which damage the cell wall and when you add amicacin to that drug, for example, cephalosporin plus amicacin is an excellent combination because amicacin goes through the damaged cell wall and acts in ribosomes and works wonders for you. 
So ampi plus delta in pneumonia, I told you one plus one was is equal to one when you add cefixin plus azithromycin. Whereas ampi plus delta is equal to one plus one is equal to four. Ceftriaxone plus delta or amikacin is one plus. Is, it acts by the principle of synergism. These combinations which you can always use. And ceftron, a quadrimoxazole is an underutilized drug. It's a good combination drug which you can. Use in UTI and enteric fever and community care MRSA probably because of its uh, allergic side effect of allergic reaction and Stephen Johnson syndrome. Probably we are underutilizing it. And again, this combination, which is widely used by most of the medical college faculty, is meropenem plus vancomycin. When the child comes to you with very uh, very sick child, ceftriaxone plus vancomycin. These are antimicrobials with different spectrum of coverage. So when you know the organisms, you can treat them right. So we'll take one common. We'll take pneumonia. As the first, as one, uh, as one, uh, as one indication. But how do you suspect the possible organism? When there is measles or pyodoma in the child, you suspect Staphylococcus. When when the child is having severe PM, you suspect Staphylococcus. When the child is having aspiration pneumonia, you suspect anaerobe. So accordingly, you can go for your combination. In community acquired pneumonia between children between three months to five years, you go for amoxiclav or ceftriaxone. You will always be right. And as per WHO classification, you can also go for your ampi genta. Whenever there is empyema, when MSSA and MRSA both can be the organisms, you go for ceftriaxone plus vanco and clinda. And in aspiration pneumonia, when your organisms is going to be along with your routine organisms, anaerobes are going to be there. Go for ceftriaxone and clinda. And again, in serious infections in young infants between less than three months, cefatoxin plus ampicillin may be a right combination for listeria coverage. Whereas in older children, we have been resorting to ceftriaxone alone, but now. Ceftriaxone is vancomycin is being given routinely for pyogenic meningitis after that Wellur study which showed penicillin resistant pneumococcus. 40 percentage of their cases were penicillin resistant pneumococcus but as far as we, we have not seen that but you always use a regional studies and institutional resistant patterns must be taken into account. When a, for example, a child with retology of fellow develops a brain abscess, go for ceftriaxone, vancomycin and metronazole to cover staphylococcus and anaerobes. In a child with brain abscess following a VP shunt, go for Miro Vanco to cover anaerobes, pseudomonas and staphylococcus. And in acute appendicitis, it's always a poly, where you are called for a call over or you go for a call over or surgeon calls you when there's a polymicrobial infection, you cannot wait for culture. You go for ceftriaxone plus metrogel or you go for single drug cefaprazone salbactam. But there is no point in giving piperacillin tazobactam plus metronazole plus amikacin for you because you wanted to cover anaerobes, you wanted to cover gram negative organs. Piptas covers everything. So if you want to do, give Piptas, Piptas alone is enough. There is no need to add the other drugs. And again in newborn infections, polymicrobial therapy is the rule. You can't give a single antibiotic. You can give any any type, any combos. Ampi genta, cefatoxin genta mycin, piperacillin tazobactam plus amikacin. Though I have taken off that combination here because it has a potential nephrotoxy but it is accepted. Meropram plus vancomycin or ciprofloxacin plus gentamycin. And if in newborn infections or severe CR infections, you have all drugs have been exhausted, last resort drug, this may be your combination. Tigicycline plus cholestin. For example, cholestin is, covers all gram-negative organisms. TG covers all gram-positive organisms. Cholestin doesn't cover MRSA, which is covered by TG. TG doesn't cover pseudomonas, which is covered by cholestin. So, uh, it is being this combination, TG plus cholestin is, is increasingly be used in ESBL or CR sepsis. And again, coming to the last one slide, uh, combined antimicrobials. Those, these are the combinations. I'm not asking you to start TG and uh, uh, cholestin initially itself. If your institution pattern shows, you start. They are not preferred in combination therapy, are not preferred in diarrheal diseases, skin and soft tissue infections, urinary tract infections and bone and joint infections because these infections are usually caused by a single group of agents, hence monotherapy is sufficient and using combination has no rationale as it leads to emergence of drug resistance. My last carry home slide is in OP practice, multiple antibiotics is never justified. It is appropriate to start empirical combination broad spectrum antibiotic therapy in a sick child. If a neonate develops fever after discharge from hospital, there is a need for you to cover nosocomial pathogen. So you will start with a higher antibiotic when the patient comes itself. In meningitis and UTI, use antibiotics that would achieve adequate levels in CSF or urine. Even if the CSF shows cefaprazone salbactam is very active in that uh, meningitis, you cannot resort to it because it doesn't penetrate the CSF. And in, a, in severe staphylococcal skin, uh, SSTA, that is skin and soft tissue infections, cover for both MSSA and UMRSA. 
and in a host with a compromised re renal function avoid nephrotoxic drugs like colistin vancomycin vancomycin is very 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 nephrotoxic especially when you start in a child with septic shock who's already having a compromised renal function you no. land up in trouble immunocompromised patient okay, always use a battery side lesion the routine use of double gram negative coverage is not is not advisable carbapenems are very useful rescue antibiotics for resistant infections and should not be used for routine infections thank you very much for patient hearing thank you thank you ma'am for the talk yep it questions any there are any questions there are no questions, questions? Yeah. Sir, there are no questions. Uh, i request the chairperson to give the momentum and honor the speaker